Welcome back to the Corporate Finance Academy. Today we're going to talk about the operating plan, annual operating plan, master budget, whatever you want to call it, uh, but how that process works, what it is, and go through some of the details. Okay, so like we mentioned, we are going to talk about the annual operating plan. We'll go through a step-by-step -step process of the different pieces of the creation of that annual plan and you know some details on how to lean or run the process if you're in FP&A or you're running an operating plan process. Some critical things to keep in mind when you go through it. So with that, let's dive in. So you hear this called different things. Uh, operating plan, annual operating plan, a master budget, uh, different companies have specific terminologies that they use for this, but they're all effectively the same thing. What you're trying to do is define the company's strategic goals that they have for the next year. And sometimes this might be for two years or three years, four years, and this really helps to get everybody aligned. So make sure that the sales team, the operating team, the finance team, HR team, everybody in the organization knows what the intention is for the next year or longer. It also is going to lock down what the company's financial targets and budget are. So the strategic goals, what do they mean in terms of numbers and how we should evaluate the business. So whether it's a publicly traded company or private company, uh, how we should measure the business and how we'll measure leadership. So. You know, a lot of people in from some companies, even from the manager level, director level, VP level, all have incentive based pay and get bonus based on if the company achieves targets or a division achieves targets. And this is the, the process that helps establish what those targets will be. Um, you also need to know your cash position and your funding requirements. This is ex especially critical for the finance team. Um, you're going to have to pay salaries, you're going to have bonuses to pay, you're going to buy capital, you're going to have capital expenditures, you're going to have money coming in from the products you sell. So you got to understand what that cash position looks like and if you need money to borrow money or if you're going to have cash coming in and you're able to maybe use some additional cash. And there's a lot of other things that you'll do with the annual operating plan from establishing how many people uh, are going to work, you know, what that headcount should be. If you need to hire people, uh, if you're going to invest in technology or engineering or R&D, and many other things. So we'll get into some of those details as we get through uh, the rest of this video. So just a quick overview of what the annual budget looks like in totality. So you have the annual budget, the master budget, you can call it, you can call it many different things, but you have that budget. Then you're going to have a couple things that happen kind of simultaneously, although the sales budget will lead the purchasing or production budget a little bit. Uh, but that's the next step. Then kind of offshoots of those is you're going to define your SG&A spend, including your headcount, your CapEx and R&D, so how much money you're going to spend on those areas and what your returns will be, inventory, and your cost of goods sold, so mainly your labor, material, and overhead related to your purchasing or product, producing the goods for the company. Then you have your cash plan, your cash flow statement, and you have an income statement and a balance sheet. And those are kind of the financial outputs of all of these things uh, that you see above. So for this annual operating plan, the question is who does the work? So in reality, you know, the finance team, finance and accounting is often kind of the gatekeeper for it where they help drive or shepherd the process through. But you will have, you have to have kind of full engagement throughout the organization. You saw in the previous chart, you've got sales elements, you've got production elements. If you have, if you're in a manufacturing business, um, HR to know how many people. So the whole organization really should be involved and have different responsibilities for pieces of the budget, but the finance team ultimately often pulls everything together. So the process itself, what does it include? 
and what has to be done. So the first steps here, you really have this sales budget. And I think of these almost as 1A and 1B. But I, I will say sales is the slightly earlier piece of the process. Um, what you're trying to understand is kind of by business unit or by region, how much can the business actually sell? And why do you need to know that? So you really need to know how much you're going to sell so you know how much you need to make. Um, you know, if we're using the example of a manufacturing company, it's how much you'll produce. And if you're a retail company or something along those lines, it's how much you have to order. And you have to know all the associated costs um, that go along with the selling and producing of those parts. So um, you then are going to have, how do you actually do it? There's tops down forecasting, there's bottoms up forecasting. And I'll touch on that on the next slide, what those mean. So we'll come back to that. If you're not sure what it is, just hold on a minute. Um, but you use things like market intelligence, economic intelligence. Sometimes these are services you can pay for research that you do, you may even employ your marketing team that tracks these things and tracks the rest of the market to understand uh, how much there is out there and how much market share you have or could win. You often rely on customer feedback, them telling you how much they think they're going to buy or just knowledge about them and how much you think they'll buy. Trends in the industry, is the industry growing or shrinking? You know, as we've gone through this COVID uh, pandemic, a lot of trends have changed. You've got industries that are hurt. You have industries that are actually moving faster. You know, if you were selling N95 masks, you maybe weren't having uh, a stellar time and then COVID hit and now you probably can't keep them on your shelves. Um, com in competitive analysis, especially in the, the, the dynamic times of COVID, you have different levels of competition in different areas and some people, some companies leaving, some companies starting up. So, uh, you're going to use all these factors to try to understand how much you're going to sell. Kind of in, in parallel to this, but probably lagging some of the information from the sales team, you want to know how much you can and should produce as a business and what is it actually going to take to produce it. So you need to understand if the business can actually satisfy the demand. So what is its capacity? So you kind of start there sometimes and say, how much could we make if we had all the people we need and we ran all of our machines at full efficiency? Um, and then you want to see if you could sell that. Uh, and if those changes in demand require you to change your footprint or purchasing strategy. So let's say you looked at your capacity and you realized you could sell it all. Do you have to acquire a new factory? Do you have to expand one? And on the flip side, if you have tons of capacity and it's open, and you can't sell it all, do you have to change something? Do you have to combine buildings or something along those lines? Um, so you're gonna look at the sales budget as an input and you're gonna to try to understand your hard and soft capacity. And what hard capacity means is machinery and equipment and how much they can produce and soft capacity would be labor. So how many people you need to produce it. Um, and you're going to look at how efficient you are, you're going to look at your manpower, and ultimately you're going to try to understand your labor and material and overhead that go along with, with producing. So a quick note on tops down versus bottoms up. Um, you know, if you think about tops down forecasting, you're really thinking about um, taking overall industry data and saying how much of this we could capture or you're taking trends or something like that. So it's, it's coming from the leadership point of view or a macroeconomic point of view and saying, well, we think we can do this much. Whereas with a bottoms up, you're really looking at, you know, granular level detail of your customers, your market, and you're probably saying, okay, here are our top 20 customers for each of these customers. Let's talk to them. Let's see how much we think they can, uh, they, we think that they'll buy from us. And you're getting to every level of detail. And similarly, if you look at tops down, bottoms up for another piece of forecasting, like forecasting your SG&A, one way to do a tops down forecast would be just take your total spend of SG&A and look at how much your top line growth is 
and say your top line growth is growing at 10%, you would just say, hey, my SGNA should only grow at 5%. The bottoms up way of doing it would be, here's what we have to produce. Let's go look at exactly how many people we have, how much they make, how many more people we need to add, and come from the bottom to build up to a number to see what it looks like. So that would be the tops down versus bottoms up methodology. Okay, so the process itself of the operating plan. We talked about the production um, and kind of the different pieces of that would be when you're just establishing your production plan, you're gonna understand how much labor, material, and overhead you're gonna spend, and you're also gonna think through your CapEx budget, as well as R&D if you're in a company that spends a lot on research and development. But, you know, like we talked about, the production side of this is really how many units you're gonna make and when you think about this, you really have to also think about your inventory. Um, because your inventory, if you have a lot of stuff in inventory and you're starting out the year, you might not have to produce as much as the demand calls for. And on the flip side, if your shelves are barren of inventory and you need some safety stock, you may actually uh, have to produce more than the demand. And when you go through this production process, you're also going to be setting your KPIs for the year. Um, you know, things like how much scrap you're going to have, your overtime, indirect labor, all of the things that you measure your business by. And then and as you do this, you're going to just establish your cost of goods sold. So when you have your production units, you got to figure out how much it costs to produce those units. So things like direct labor, direct material, and overhead. And when you do this, you also are going to set productivity targets. So generally, every business is going to have some sort of target where they anticipate that they get more productive as a business. And you know, a lot of times you'll see something in the neighborhood of three percent as the target uh, for productivity. So meaning you you need to get three percent more productive in your manufacturing, which will drive your costs down as a business. And lastly, you have CapEx and R&D. So production obviously requires capital spend, and sometimes it requires R&D. So you think about CapEx, it's going to be things like you're going to have to replace equipment, you're going to have to repair equipment, maintenance, software. Uh, you might have to do IT projects. You might have to do research and development to develop your project, products. All of these things go into this bucket of CapEx and R&D. Very important to know especially as we get into our cash planning. So the next piece is SG&A. So your SG&A budget needs to be set. Um, and really the first thing you have to do to, to do this is to understand your sales and production plans. And you're going to have to set things like compensation and benefits and bonus and travel and training. And, you know, one thing to note about SG&A is for all of these things that you go through in the planning process, oftentimes the SG&A process is the most, I'd say, emotional of the, of the elements. So there's a lot of emotion that goes into this. Um, and it's because you're talking about people's compensation and their benefits and their bonuses and how many people leaders can have on their team to get the job done. So it can be extremely... Uh, an extremely emotional piece of the budget setting process. So then you have your your cash flow statement, your income statement, your balance sheet. Um, you know, when you think about the cash flow piece of, of your budgeting process, you've got your sales budget, um, in your top line sales. So this is going to be, you know, and you're going to combine that with, that leads right into your AR and your DSO. So days sales outstanding. And these are being your cash inflows. we are still learning how to use this thing. So we got your cash inflows. And then on the other side, you've got your cash outflows. Um, you know, you get your AP and your days to pay. You've got uh, CapEx, R&D, 
we talked about. Um, these are all cash out, right? And then obviously you have your working capital, which is going to include some of the stuff that we talked about. Okay, and then you've got your income statement is going to have a lot of the same input. So your sales plan is going to lead right into your income statement. Um, you've got your all your SG&A expenses. You get your cost of goods sold from your production, which is your labor, material, and overhead. Um, so that's all going to affect you. And as you go through all this, you know, all these pieces start to link together. So your CapEx is going to land on your balance sheet. Your AR is going to land on your balance sheet. All your working capital accounts. We said AR, but we've got... AP, you know, you've got your starting cash and starting inventory. And then you've got, we know we have our demand and our sales. And we also have our production. So we know that'll help us get to our ending inventory balance. But you have all of these factors that start to come together and create your financials from all the steps that we did prior. So what is the finance team's role in this? So we as the finance team, we try to coordinate this process. We drive the conversations and the discussions, we have to make the schedule for it, and we have to try to translate the information we get from the operating team, which sometimes uh, isn't easy to do because they speak a different language, but we have to translate that into the operation will speak into the financials. Um, but ultimately, I think finance at most companies or many companies runs the show, create templates, and we collect the inputs, create the timelines, we create the, the templates for the PowerPoint presentations, the DEX presentations, that leadership, that are given to leadership, to the board, uh, roll up numbers from multiple sources. That's one thing to think about. Uh, when you go when you go through a planning process is it's not as simple as um, you know just saying here's my numbers you're often looking at you know if you have I'll make up an example as we go but let's say you have a headquarters let's say we're using like Nike as an example and I have no idea how they're split up but they would say you know basketball as a vertical or division you've got running You've got uh, soccer. I apologize to our non-US viewers for the soccer comment, but, and then the other thing you have coming across often is you have like North America, you have Asia, you know, <laughs> you've got Europe. So however our companies Structured, you have all these different verticals, and often you're trying to figure out which level you connect the data for. You know, you're going to do it at these levels, you're going to collect it by region. Sometimes you have to do both, so it, it can be tricky. And at the end of the day, we have to create a final version of what this plan looks like. So, some things to think about when you're going through that process. One is you really need to stay as close as possible to your operational counterparts. At the top of the house, it might be presidents, VPs, GMs, but at the lower level, it might be you know your local, your sales guy in your region or in your your division. Um, it could be the people at the shop that you work at. It, it really can depend. You got to stay close to them and be on the same page. When you think about timeline, you want to work backwards. Allow yourself time to roll up. So, if something is due, if everything's going to be due December 1st, you have to think backwards and say, well, we need the full roll up by, you know, a week before that. And we need to, to get that full roll up. We know it's going to take our finance team seven days from submission to get it fully rolled up. We know that the divisional divisions are going to want to review it before that. So you just keep working backwards to get to the start date of when you need and make sure you're giving yourself time, especially the finance team, time to take all the inputs and and get them ready. And, and you got to remember that 
even just because you set a deadline doesn't mean people are going to hit it. So you have to build in some buffer. So if you say something's due on November 1st, if you need it by November 1st, you may want to ask for it you know, three to five days before uh, the end of October so that you can get it on time. And you want to try to get everybody's agreement to those deadlines because if you make unrealistic deadlines, people just are going to ignore them. Um, you know, version control is really critical. You have a hundred different Excel files floating around, different versions. It's hard. It's easy for that to get out of hand. It's hard to manage it. So be careful and have a plan. There's a lot of way that you, ways you can do it. You can use cloud-based files, but then you risk people messing up the file. So you can use some different security provisions, uh, cell, protect certain cells, but you, you got to have a plan for how you're going to control the version. Um, and you got to really try hard to leave emotion out of it. People will get emotional. Remember, sales incentives are tied to these things. Uh, you know, leadership bonuses are tied. People have a lot of money on the line. Everybody, to some extent, is going to try to have their target set low because they want to be able to make their bonus. So you got to keep that in mind. You have a lot of different personalities. So you know, try to always use data and facts when you're in discussions and try to take your emotion out of it as much as possible. Again, you know, just a quick outline of what the budget process looks like um, from top to bottom. And it's, it can be more detailed than this, but this gives you a nice feel for what it looks like in an ordinary cycle. And just a couple last things to think about. Understand hedges and stretches, right? Um, you know, when you, when you have a stretch that you're assigning to somebody, so let's say a division says they're going to do $200 million of EBITDA and you're going to give them 220. It shouldn't just be a blind 220. You should have some idea or a project that could help them get to 220. Even if that project is going to take a lot of work and might not be successful, you should be able to say, hey, look, we want you to finish your development of this product sooner and get it to market by the middle of the year so that you can make an additional 10 or $20 million. There should be some basis to that stretch. And then, you know, you're going to have to deal with people hedging. So as you go up multiple levels of the organization, if everybody hedges you $5, $5 million by the time you get to the top, depending on the levels, it could be 15 or 20 or $30 million uh, of hedges out there and things don't look good. And then at the same time, you know, if you're at the top of the house uh, and you're in headquarters fp &A, you might keep a couple hedges for headquarters knowing that some of the businesses might not make their numbers. Um, but the biggest thing I'd say to my advice to finance folks is take the time to really understand what is happening operationally. You have to be able to tell a story with the numbers of what's happening in the business. So you're going to have to know the assumptions that drive those numbers, um, especially when you're in bottoms up, uh, using bottoms up type roll ups for your estimates. So, you know, that's it. Uh, there's some pieces of advice. I've been through many of these in my career. Uh, so if, if you have questions or comments, please leave them. Uh, but it, the, it's, a, it's really a great process. I think when, you're, when you join a new company or you take a new job in an existing company, these annual plan settings are one of the best times to actually learn the business. So they can be difficult, but really embrace it. Use it as an opportunity to learn as much as you possibly can about the business and it's also a great way to win uh, credit and, and, and develop relationships with the operating team. If you're successful in, in these plan processes, they'll remember that and, and you can really improve that relationship. So that's it. You know, please, please subscribe. I hope you like the videos. Like them if you do. Um, leave questions, comments, and we'd be happy to, to help you out wherever we can. That's it for now. We'll have more videos coming soon, so take care.